Euromax highlights coming up on the show. A special treat. Asparagus season in Germany is a real draw for connoisseurs. A step ahead. Shoes by French designer Pierre Hardy are out of this world. A cut above. Spanish architect Antonio Cruz has built an impressive home for himself in Seville. Euromax highlights. And here's your host, Robin Merrill. Hello and a very warm welcome to the show. Germany is the perfect place to grow white asparagus here in Europe. And the Germans can't wait for Spargelzeit, asparagus time, which is roughly two months from the middle of April. Stalls spring up on the roadside everywhere, offering freshly cut white stalks. And in some of the main growing areas, they even organise special culinary trips for asparagus lovers. We visited one such region in southern Germany. It's 8.30 a.m. At the hotel entrance, we meet up with Martin Hermann, a chef with two Michelin stars. Good morning, good morning. Good morning dear guests, and welcome. This morning, we're going to visit our asparagus supplier, Wirt. They'll show us what you have to know when it comes to harvesting asparagus. The Galliot family from Belgium have booked to go on the trip. I eat an awful lot of asparagus every single day of the season. The Galliots are regulars at Dollenberg Hotel, partially because of the region's culinary attraction. Back in Bruges, they own a restaurant, but they've never taken part in an asparagus harvest. It's a 30-minute drive over country roads to the Wurz Asparagus Farm. It covers 12 hectares and is one of the biggest in the region. The asparagus pickers have been out on the field since 7 a.m. The visitors from Dollenberg arrive with farmer Willy Wurt at 9.30. You expose the asparagus with two fingers. Don't dig down more than three times. Then angle the asparagus knife and carefully cut through the asparagus. Pull up slightly and that's it. Asparagus is very sensitive. Each stalk has to be individually picked when it's still under the earth. The vegetable changes color when exposed to sunshine, which means a loss of quality. Harvesters have to be very careful not to cut too deep or they'll damage the entire rootstock. To do one is no problem, but I think when you have to do it the whole day, staying like that, and then work over with the hands, it will be uh, not so easy, no? And the finger is a little bit uh, driving in the earth, yeah? It will be a, a hard job, I think, yeah? In the high season, the harvesters spend up to eight hours a day out in the fields. Most of them are surprised to find out how much work it is, how much effort goes into it. That justifies the price. Then they understand why asparagus is so expensive. 600 kilos are harvested every day at the start of the season. In high season, that increases to three tons. The crop is sorted in the production hall. Each stalk is individually classified according to diameter, length, color, shape and firmness. When I buy asparagus, it's important to buy the top quality produce for my guests. So I only buy stalks that are quite firm and straight. This one is crooked. It's also really important that it's fresh. When you press on the bottom of it, a little water should come out. That's one way of testing how fresh it is. The tour ends two hours later in the shop. A kilo of class one asparagus costs 10 euros at the moment. That's expensive for a vegetable, but it is the first asparagus of the season. The group returns to the Dollenberg Hotel and Hermann's kitchen. He shows the Galliot family how to prepare the asparagus. The asparagus is peeled from the tip downwards. Then it's sliced and put into water containing butter, salt, sugar and lemon. 
In 15 to 20 minutes, the asparagus is ready to serve with turbot filet and moral mushrooms. It's best accompanied by fresh and fruity wines, a Riesling or a Rivana. It's the last day of the Gallyats holiday in the Black Forest. Tomorrow, the family will return to Bruges, where asparagus is also a delicacy. Their own restaurant serves asparagus prepared according to a traditional Flemish recipe. Now, as a man who wears flat shoes, I have no idea how women can stay upright in high heels, and I guess I'll never know. However, the French designer Pierre Hardy certainly knows, as he makes some of the most beautiful and sought-after high-heeled shoes in the world. These shoes almost look too good to wear. Pierre Hardy's avant-garde creations resemble works of art. Not that surprising when you consider that before he became a successful shoe designer, the Frenchman studied fine art in Paris. I was also doing a lot of drawings for fashion magazines at the time, accessories mainly. So when Dior asked me if I wanted to design their shoe collection, I wasn't aware how big a deal that was. For the next three years, I ended up designing exclusively for Dior. Eleven years ago, he set up his own label and developed his unmistakable style. Pierre Hardy is regarded as the artist among the shoe designers. There are a lot of people who make shoes, but the question is how you make them. I hope that I take an artistic approach. His models for women and men are real head-turners futuristic sports shoes, and elegant stilettos alike. This is a very delicate shoe, ultra-feminine, almost cliched, made from dark suede with rhinestone highlights and ostrich feathers, used very visually. And this is one of my favorite models, a very geometric model where I've experimented with different colors to create a new effect. The decorative features were placed in unusual spots to create a new volume. I'm always trying to achieve the maximum effect with the least possible effort. Twelve centimeter heels are not out of the question for Pierre Adi. But women should be able to walk in his architectural creations. You should feel good in a shoe. Heels of 10 centimeters and more have to be comfortable too. That's the basis. And you try then to work around that, which means creating shoes that are new, sexy, feminine and different each season. Sexy, féminin, sensuel, différent chaque saison. Whether they're comfortable or not, the Parisian shoe designer's extravagant creations are ideal for the red carpet. His customers include stars such as actress Nicole Kidman and Sharon Stone. Another fan of his work is the editor of French Vogue, Karine Reutfeld. He's a man of many talents, and he's also a very good teacher. I've seen him with his students. The star designer spends every Tuesday teaching students from the renowned Dupéré Fashion School in Paris. I find the exchanges with students very refreshing. Our relationship is not a hierarchical one. We don't have to concern ourselves with financial matters, production procedures, or issues of profitability. And so I automatically gain some distance to my everyday life. Once a week, I do something completely different. But as if that wasn't enough, Pierre Hardy also finds time to work for other labels. For the last 20 years, he's been creating shoes for the French luxury label Hermès. If I was just making my own collection, I would get bored very quickly. That wouldn't be enough. If I work in other firms, I build up a real relationship. For example, at Hermès. I have to consider the brand and the history of this fashion house. Hermès customers have completely different expectations. I work completely differently. 
That's very exciting. Pierre Hardy's work with the Gap fashion chain is a different type of challenge. He's been producing a mini collection for it for the last three years. That means shoe lovers on tighter budgets can also afford to buy his creations. Well, from strutting your stuff in high heels to a real fitness workout, many jobs nowadays involve sitting at a desk in front of a computer and not doing much physical exercise, so people go to the gym or jog or keep active. But how disciplined are you? Perhaps you need someone to urge you on and teach you how best to exercise. No wonder the personal trainer business is booming. Twice a week, radio producer Jochen Trus gets his gym clothes on. Personal trainer and former decathlete Jürgen Siebenhunen makes sure Jochen keeps going for a full hour through the forest. Siebenhunen's programs are tailor-made to ensure his clients achieve what they wouldn't alone. This client thought nothing could be easier than going for a run before he tried it. I made my life difficult by sprinting off like I was possessed. I ran for 10 minutes and then collapsed. I ended up collapsing in the middle of the forest. I swore to myself I'd never do that again. An hour's personal training with Siebenhunen costs 70 to 100 euros. Who says it's worth every cent. In return for his investment, he receives clear training goals, professional guidance, and the knowledge that he's respecting his body. More and more Germans want to get in shape, and they're prepared to invest money for a personal trainer. The clientele is very mixed. I get people from all walks of life. There's the classic group, including celebrities, actors and other show people, and politicians. But there are also a lot of ordinary people who don't earn much, who also like giving their health and well-being a little boost. Ten years ago, personal training was a luxury reserved for celebrities like Madonna and Heidi Klum. For them, looking good has always been a priority. The branch is now booming. The word personal trainer is entered into internet search engines 6,000 times a day in Germany alone. Personal trainers are also in increasing demand among people looking to win personal kudos by running marathons. Lots of people want to get fit for marathons, but many of them don't have the necessary prerequisites. I see that after each Berlin marathon. People who watch the event from the sidewalk ask me if they can get in shape to do that too. I have to question them carefully about their sporting backgrounds. Syros A. Rahman is partly responsible for the personal fitness boom. Eleven years ago, he founded the German Association of Personal Trainers. He also runs a dedicated website. A large number of the 550 personal trainers in Germany offer their services via the site. Demand has risen sharply over the last decade. Thank you. One of the reasons is that we live in an aging society. It's becoming more important to remain fit and healthy as we get older and to feel healthy too. People over 40 know they can still do a lot to improve their health, their looks and their level of fitness. City employee Renate Hahn is one of those people. Three years ago, she recruited Siebenhunen as a private trainer, as well as her fitness, her productivity in general has also improved. I notice it at work too. I have no problem with really long meetings anymore. I used to have a lot of limitations. I was afraid I wouldn't have the stamina and wouldn't manage it. Now I can really defend myself mentally as well as physically, and that feels great. Siebenhunen often turns his clients' lifestyles on their heads. He also has a degree in physical education and offers them nutritional advice. Losing weight is an important incentive for many clients. And it doesn't take long before most see the first improvements. 
es ist sehr zielorientiert, deswegen ist es also... It is very goal-oriented. When you do the math, you realize it's not really that expensive to have a personal trainer. You reach your goals faster, because the trainer pinpoints them in advance and develops a plan to make sure you achieve them rapidly and effectively. And there's also a fun element. You mustn't forget that. Jürgen Siebenhünen believes personal training is on the rise. The social pressure on people to conform to the classic slim and athletic body shape shows no sign of abating. The Spanish architectural partnership of Cruz and Ortiz have made a name for themselves designing stadiums, railway stations and other vast building projects. So what's it like for a top architect when you scale it down a bit and make it very personal, that is, designing your own home? Antonio Cruz showed us round his private house in his hometown, Seville. Antonio Cruz built his house in the middle of the old city of Seville 15 years ago. Hello, welcome to my house. If you would like to see it, it will be my pleasure to show it to you. When you open the door, you are immediately in a spacious foyer. From here, the path leads to the interior of the house, or directly to the central patio. If we go this way, we reach a small courtyard that is directly connected to the dining room. If we continue a little further, we reach the main courtyard of the house. The building was erected at the end of the 20th century, but in some ways it still has the typical construction style of the traditional Arab houses here in Sevilla. That means it seems rather plain from the outside and doesn't reveal much about itself. The entire charm is brought about in the interior courtyards. The house opens up inwardly to the patios. Antonio Cruz designed the house himself. It's 500 square meters in size. The rooms are arranged around the courtyards. The larger courtyard here is 10 meters by 14, and the little one over there is four and a half by four and a half. We also have a small swimming pool. We've placed it a bit higher and hidden it behind the bushes so that the pool isn't too obtrusive, especially in the winter. Through this door, we are now entering the living area, of which the dining room comes first. From there, we go through the kitchen, which also has direct access to the courtyard, and then we reach the living room, which we see here. The furnishings are a mixture of styles, quite arbitrary actually. We have furniture from various eras and of different styles. I like it when you enter a house and notice that the furniture was acquired gradually, one piece after the other. That's important to me. From here the corridor leads to the dining room and the entryway. That means the house has two paths. And from here, a stairway leads to the second floor. Thanks to this little atrium, we're able to bring nature into the interior. The area here on the second floor is private. In 
bueno, este es el sitio donde This here is my favorite spot, where I like to sit with my wife Asunta. And with a fire in the fireplace, it's very pleasant here. Finally today, five members of one family are the winners of this year's Art Cologne Prize, an award given in recognition of outstanding service to contemporary or modern art. The Gresslin family sold their business some years ago and have pursued their passion for modern art ever since. And they've turned their hometown in the Black Forest into a veritable paradise for contemporary art lovers. The Gresslins have been collecting art for more than three decades. They're also keen to show their works to the public. Hence the 10th annual Art Cologne Prize was awarded to the whole family. It's a great honor to win this prize. And it's in recognition of our efforts on behalf of contemporary art. Anna Gresslin is a collector and her children as well. Most members of the family have turned their hobby into their career as an art dealer or museum director. It all began here in the Black Forest. This is the family home. Anna Gresslin's late husband Dieter bought their first painting and hung it here in the 1970s. He was most interested in post-war art. Ever since, art has become the main occupation and preoccupation of the entire family. It's wonderful to live among works of art. It's important for the entire family and for keeping the family together. We always have something to talk about. Their house is full of artworks. They have a gallery in the basement. The family fortune allows them to indulge in their passion for artwork. Anna's children collect mainly works by contemporary artists and exhibit pieces in their own museum, the Kunstraum Gresslin. Each acquisition is a family affair. If I discover something I think we should add to the collection, then I talk to my brother and sisters, and we make the decision together. And that often involves heated debates. It's also an intellectual challenge, and very enjoyable. The family own more than 1,500 works. The collection is worth millions. And they are friends with many of the artists. Some owe their breakthrough to the Gresslins. Their taste has sometimes proved controversial. We have always tried to choose good artists and never cared whether other people agreed with us on that. Martin Kippenberger is a good example. For a long time, people in the art world said his art wasn't good art. What the Gresslins consider good art can be seen at 20 venues all over St. Georgen. The art tour starts here. It takes you around the town and takes three or four hours. This town of 15,000 is crammed full of modern art, and you can find it in all kinds of places. In the park. In display cases. And even in the train station. This is not exactly a beautiful room. It's really anything but a Kunstraum or art space. But that's what we like about these rooms. They're all different. The Gresslins are important patrons of the arts here in Germany, 
they are well known in the art scene. Artists often visit. The family may be wealthy, but they can't indulge their every whim. Collecting is like an addiction. You always need more, another fix. It's just the same. It's an expensive habit, so you can't fulfill all your dreams at once. But it's good to have something to look forward to, to have dreams you hope to fulfill. It's a very beneficial kind of addiction. May the Gresslins continue collecting art for a long time to come. You'll find more reports from Euromax on YouTube. Just go to the site, type in Deutsche Welle English, and the choice is yours. That's all for now, though, so until next time, bye-bye.